The Italians, as you know, called the period 1800 to 1850 the Ottocento. And you seem to have, if this is a, a spotlight on Bonning, Bonning has always had his spotlight on the Ottocento, that ate that period. Would you have liked to live in that time? Well, in one way, very much so. I'd, I'd love to have been back there. I'd love to have known the great people that were alive, the people that are especially interesting to me. On the other hand, I think I might miss the DVDs and the telephone, but apart from that, yes, I would like to have lived in the yeah. 19th century. You might have met Rossini, for example. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> Richard, have you ever seen the original score of Barber of Seville? The original? No. I, I once was in Bologna, and I went in and said, can I see it? And they just chucked it at me. And it's fascinating because the chorus parts and the orchestral parts are sort of rushed through. Mm -hmm. and, and he puts repeat marks, because he was very lazy, oh, yeah. wherever he could. But the cadenzas are written out with the utmost clarity. Because mm -hmm. uh, he didn't want singers doing all their terrible things to his... Exactly. <laughs> so what do you think he would have been doing? Would you have been conducting... They didn't go in for conductors much, oh, did they? Oh, I don't know. Who knows? I would have been enjoying myself, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to have been a composer? Did you ever think of it? No, I don't have talents for... I mean, I can write cadenzas and do bits and pieces. No, I'm no, no composer. Uh -huh. I never had any desire. Yeah. When you first came to, to London, you were only 20, I think? 19. 19. Long time ago. And you, how did you get a job? Well, I mean, that was never a problem because, I mean, I had a scholarship at the Royal College and I stayed there for a year. I didn't like it very much. I, was, I, was, I didn't care for my, my teacher. That I didn't care for anything about the Royal College in those days, I have to tell you. <laughs> and I left the Royal College and I went to a man called Herbert Fryer, oh, yes. who was a very great teacher. He was a pupil of Busoni. And he, what he didn't teach me wasn't worth knowing. I mean, he was fantastic on the romantic repertoire on Chopin and et cetera, et cetera. And he was, he was very good to me, and I had a great time with him. And as for, for earning money, well, I mean, all the singers used to be banging on my door because I only charged seven and sixpence. And uh, <laughs> so I, I, I was, you know, coaching. And, but how did you get to know the singers, and how did they get to know you? Well, I, I, I met some of them at the, the Royal College. I met some of, uh, through Joan, who, who knew some of them, you know, and then one would tell another. And but you didn't meet Joan when you were 19. Oh, I met him much before. We did a lot of concerts together. Did you? In, no. in, in, in Australia. In Australia, all over New South Wales. I mean, when I say a lot, perhaps say eight or ten, something like that. And sometimes I played for her. Sometimes she played, sang with somebody else, and I played some solos. At, uh, there were you know, the music clubs. That was a big thing in Australia. They had all these music clubs all over the place. And, and uh, all the young students got the opportunity to get up and exhibit. <laughs> it, was, it was very, very good. And I was also lucky in Australia because, you know, at the conservatorium we had a, a very good orchestra and the students, I, I went through diploma class with Eugene Goosens, who was a fantastic man, very severe and strong, but he taught us a great deal. And uh, we were allowed to play concertos. And, and I mean, I actually played in, in public, the, let me see, Beethoven th three and four, and the Liszt number one, and two Mozarts, and, and the Grieg. So you know, it was great. And when I came to the Royal College, that's why I was off them, because they said, oh, you're only from the, from the colonies. Or they, I, don't know whether, I don't know whether they put it in quite those words, but just about. And they said, no, you have to stay here for a few years before you can play a good shirt. I was, I was very fed up. I was full of myself in those days. What was Joan like when you first met her? Joan, she was still very much under her mother's thumb, you know. <laughs> the mother told her what to do and dressed her and, and what not. And Joan had a wonderful and glorious natural voice. And she had studied, well not studied, she watched her mother, she listened to her mother rehearse. And her mother had studied with um, a pupil of Marchese. And her mother knew how to sing. She had a very beautiful, a really beautiful voice. She should have had a career, but she was a, a nervous woman. She didn't want to have a career. And they, the, the teachers wanted her to come over to Europe, and she wouldn't, she wouldn't go. But she kept up the singing. And Joan used to listen to her constantly. And her mother said, I never taught her. But it's, in a way, it's not true, because she taught her by osmosis, or whatever you like to say. But, uh, and then la later on, 
there were some singing teachers got hold of her and, and start said, oh, here's a, the next dramatic soprano. And they gave her Isolde and, and uh, Joconda and Aida and all those things when she was much too young and much yeah. too inexperienced yeah. to sing it to cope with them. Yeah. And uh, I fortunately sort of caught up with her in London because we weren't that close in Australia. We would work together, but we weren't that close. But I, and when she came to London in 1951, I met her at the boat and, and, and we sort of started from there and I worked with her constantly. And the interesting thing was that in listening to her, when she was singing the way these people in Australia had been trying to teach her, she would crack on high C's and she was trying to enlarge the voice unnaturally, especially going like that at the top. And, uh, but when she was not thinking about singing, she would sing in an entirely different way. And it was a very natural, wonderful sound, and quite, quite different. And it, I mean, people credit me with having taught her everything, and I think that's a lot of nonsense. All I did was to convince her that what she had by nature, God-given, was the way she should sing. And, and that, that took quite a while because she had been brought up to believe that Wagner was God and that all this canary bird singing was... That took some convincing. Yeah. We had a few rows. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because such a lot of... How did you of get the job at Covent Garden? Did I, they I, ne I never had a job at Covent Garden. What? I was just a pest. <laughs> I drove, I drove them nuts, but, but I, I have no, had no job at Covent Garden. I thought you were a repeti repetiteur at no, Covent Garden. No, never, never. Oh, I, right. I mean, I did, <laughs> I did all Joan's work, work with her at home because uh, after a while we found that it was, it was the best arrangement, you know. Because, I mean, I, I, I would jump up and down because I thought they were teaching her the wrong things. Because when Joan, she auditioned for Covent Garden and she had to do four auditions before they accepted her, yeah. which is interesting. I mean, she confused them to death. She sang them uh, some Varga, she sang them Puritani, you know, she sang everything. Really? And she, which she could sing well. I mean, she, she, she could have had, a, her career could have gone in any direction. But uh, then they, when they engaged her, I think they thought, well, here's our follow-up to Sylvia Fisher, who was getting on then. And the first things they gave her to study were Rosen Cavalier, Chris Sotomus, and... Uh, Oh, Siglinda. What part in, in Rosen Cavalier? In, Which the part? The in. What? The, the Marshallin. Oh, my God. And, a, and a, a girl who had no idea about acting and no feeling for the stage at that time. And, and uh, I mean, of course, I jumped up and down, as you, as you might imagine, and made a thorough nuisance of myself. But uh, eventually, I mean, the BBC were always very good to her because they, they could see that she could sing other things, and they gave her a lot of interesting work. But, but Covent Garden, for a while, did not want to. And then eventually they gave her the Ol Olympia, the doll in the Tales of Hoffman. Now, she was a big girl. She, said, I was the, she called herself the biggest doll in the business. <laughs> but um, the doll was such a success in the house. I mean, the, after the doll song, five minutes applaud, applause, when she did all this waltzing around and flew off the stage, another five minutes of applause, they couldn't get on with the opera. It, and so that, that decided Covent Garden that maybe there was some, some truth in the, in the matter. And uh, then they gave her eventually Gilda and, and eventually Regal. At first they gave her parts like um, uh, um, Rhine Maiden. Oh, yes, she sang all the Rhine Maidens and Valkyries. Third Lady. And the first lady. First her lady. debut was the first lady, which of course is a very great part. Yes. So she didn't debut in a small role. After that, she did some Clotildes with, with Maria Callas, and she did uh, f um, High Priestesses and, and, and Frasquitas in Carmen, things yes. like that. And that was good for her because she got the feeling of the stage. Yes. And, and, and it's very interesting. I mean, I suppose I can, uh, with, with the distance in mind, with this, so, so much having happened over the years, I can remember her. She was very awkward on the stage in the beginning, and then when she got to the middle of her career, she developed a presence which was unbelievable. I mean, when she walked onto the stage in The Merry Widow, you couldn't believe what you were seeing. She didn't have to sing. But that was something that, that, that got developed over the years. And I, how it got developed, I wouldn't like to say. She was lucky. She worked with many very interesting people. Zeffirelli helped her a lot. Uh, Carl Ebert helped her a lot, uh, Tito Gabbianco and Lotfi Mansura, they all helped her a great deal. 
And uh, I think Zeffirelli was the breakthrough because he made her feel that she was glamorous. Hmm. Marvellous. She was very lucky to have, I think, the support of David Webster too. David Webster was wonderful to her. He always believed in her and, and he, was a, he was a wonderful man. I mean, he wasn't a musician, but he knew he ran that house fantastically and, yeah. uh, and, and the Covent Garden in the 50s and 60s was amazing. And uh, even with everything in English, sorts of English, with, with some, of the, <coughs> some of the foreign singers singing in, in, in polyglottic, it was, it was all very amusing. But They weren't but allowed to sing in German, were they? Not in the 50s, no, yeah. no, no. <laughs> And uh, uh, Flagstad and Hotter. Well, oh, they did all the they, in no, English? they did the ring in German. What? They did the ring in German. Yeah. Oh, did they? Oh, yes. The ring was always in German. Yeah. And thank God I heard Flagstad. Wonderful. I, and in fact, she put me off Wagner for life because it was. <laughs> no, she, believe me, she was so wonderful. I heard her, her Parsifal is engraved in my mind, and I won't see it again. I'll never see Parsifal. I'll never listen to it again. I don't want, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, other things I have listened to, but I mean, as the Sieglinde, as both Brunhildes, as, as uh, Isolde, she was, she was the greatest. And, and ever since then, as far as I'm concerned, there's been no singer can even touch her. No. Not, not in that repertoire. She was what, absolutely. There's something wonderful. about the, the greatest voices that seems to be hit one's emotions over and above music and oh, in the intellect. Well, this, this is the thing. I mean, Flagstad, somebody like Teb Baldi, it wasn't just singing. It was great, great, great singing and great technical singing. Yes. But there was something, something over and beyond that. Yes. Very strange thing. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Teb Baldi. Uh, I think that's your first Desert Island disc, isn't well, it? Well, it's interesting. You should say Desert Island disc, because that makes me laugh. If I were on a desert island, I would not have any discs. <laughs> But I, I brought along a few to amuse you, perhaps, but no, I, I'm, I don't know. I'd, I'd take some videos or some DVDs. <laughs> right. So would you tell us about your... My, the music's in my head. I don't need to hear it. Yes. Uh, would, would you like to say something about your first disc, then? That, that's what, the Tebaldi one? Tebaldi. Yeah. Oh, it's just a, it's a little song of, of Tosti, which I recorded with, with Tebaldi. I did th three discs with her towards the end of her life. And she was absolutely a, a, the most adorable woman to work with, I can't tell you. She was such a lovely person. And uh, she sometimes was having some technical difficulties, but she always overcame them. And, and, and it was wonderful working with her. I, I, I always feel it's something I'm grateful to God for letting me work with Debaldi. Obviously, the turning point, the great uh, first climax in, in Joan's career was the <coughs> Lucia di Lamamor in 1959? Yeah, it was really, although she had uh, already had a big triumph in the Vancouver Festival as Donana, which was the year before, <coughs> and her Gilda wasn't bad either at Covent Garden. Yeah. But yes, it was the big thing because it was the first big thing she'd done in Europe in Italian. And uh, it was a, a whole interesting story because Webster, Sir David Webster, promised her Lucia, or he, first of all, he promised her a title role of her own, and then he promised her Lucia. And uh, when it came towards the event, one day <coughs> there, there was a big meeting in Covent Garden, and David Webster hung the sets of Louise for the board to have a look at, because I believe a certain member of the board <coughs> was very anti having Lucia in Dilemma More with Joan in the repertoire. And um, I better not tell you who it was. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Webster said, to, we, we of course realised what was going on. Webster said, don't worry, do He said, I'm just showing them the Louise because it's falling to bits and there's no way we'll use it. <laughs> so, and then, of course, he went on and, and did the Lu Lucia for her. First of all, he commissioned, I think it was uh, Arnold Haskell, to write a, a libretto for her in English. And... Uh, we went through that and were pretty horrified, and so he changed it to Italian, thank God. And then, of course, he engaged Tullio Serafin, who was a very, very great man, as far as I'm concerned, and with all the great experiences behind him of great singers and great conductors. And, and then he brought in Zeffirelli to produce it. So she had the best of everything to, to work with. And, uh, of course, it, it made history, as you know. I remember Walter Legg told me that it was his idea to send Joan to Seraphim. Do you think that was a, 
a bit of a lie, lie on his part? I would. Or a bit of a, a fancy? I would think it might have been. Yeah. <laughs> Had she worked with Seraphine before? No, the first time. <clears throat> and we went there to, to Italy, and uh, he was wonderful. He was a tiny little old man, always, well, not tiny this way, tiny that way. And uh, he always had his, uh, his hat, Homburg hat on all the time. He never, never took it off. He played the piano with his hat on. It was wonderful. And uh, he, he, in, in rehearsing with Joan, it was so interesting because he would sing phrases for her and it sounded like callous. So uh, in other words, one realized that callous had learned already a great deal from him, and I'm sure she did. And... Uh, he, he, I mean, he was wonderful. He was very pleased with the way everything had been prepared. And, and she got a cold, nasty cold. He said, don't come to me with that cold, get rid of it. And he said to me, you come. And he was really wonderful. And he, and he went through Norma and Puritani and Sonambula with me. And that, that, that were great lessons, let me tell you. Joan always had terrible trouble with her bronchial... No, she had terrible sinus trouble. Sinus. Yeah, and eventually she had an operation which, which <coughs> fixed it, but it was, a, it was a, d a dangerous operation, especially in those days. <coughs> and she, her doctor was Dr. Griffiths, who was at... at Ivo uh, Griffiths. Ivo Griffiths, exactly. A professional Co Welshman. That's right. <laughs> but uh, he, he was Covent Garden's doctor, and he had examined the vocal cords of Tetrazzini and Melba, and he told me that uh, Joan had the strongest vocal cords he had ever seen in his life which is an interesting thing, yeah. yeah. But he was very worried about doing the operation because he said it is so dangerous because one could damage the vocal cords putting the anaesthetic down yeah. the throat. And he was, he was terrified about it, but it all worked out. The only thing is we, he sent us off to um, the south of France for two, two or three weeks after, and he said to her, don't speak, you mustn't speak for three weeks. She was pretty good, she didn't speak. But <laughs> at the end of that, she came, we came back and he said, now go home and, and sing. And, and, and she came home, and nothing. It was terrifying. I mean, it really was very, very frightening. And uh, she went in to him, and he looked at her, uh, her th throat, and he said, well, there's nothing wrong with you. And excuse the language, she said, bugger off home and sing all weekend. <laughs> and she did that, just that, and, and the voice came back, of course. Yeah. It was just, Fine. He was a very uh, rude person. Oh, he was a great old boy. He, I was he called once, a spade a spade. I was with him once and, and the assistant came in and said, Sir John Gielgud is on the phone from Stratford. He said, tell the bugger to wait. <laughs> 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 but it was a polyps, wasn't it? Oh, don't that ask was me. removed? No. Yes, yeah, something. No, I don't think so. I, I, don't, I honestly don't know what it was. It, oh. was, it, it was sinus. Oh. I don't, but I she don't. suffered from it all her life. Yes, yeah, since she was a very young I girl. I mean, even after that operation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. From, but uh, after the operation, much less, much less. What she suffered from was abscesses in the ears. And they, they were very, very scary because they're very painful, extremely painful. And I'll tell you a story, if you forgive me, it's horrible. Um, <laughs> she was singing Lucia de Lamamore in, with, uh, with Maestro Serafin in Palermo, about 1960, I think it was. And uh, she had abscesses in both ears at the same time, and Joan would never cancel. I mean, to, to, she had to be flat on her back before she would cancel anything. She would not cancel. And I said, you can't sing like that. She said, I'm going to sing, and then that was that. She said it was, she was going to do something, she did it. And she came on, and she sang, and she sang. It was very good. But in the middle of the mad scene, one abscess burst. <laughs> And blood literally coursed down the, the, this white costume, which already had some blood on it. But Before it should do. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, the chorus lady next to her fell right down in a dead faint. <laughs> Absolutely fainted. And uh, I rushed around to, to the dressing room as, as the curtain came down. I said, oh, dear, how, how, what, how are you? Oh, she said, it's so marvelous. I can hear again. <laughs> Oh, she, she had a lot of courage. <laughs> yeah. Going back a little bit, what was it? Did she talk about singing with Callas? She was a confidante, wasn't she? And Not a great deal. Callas was always very nice to her. 
and they kept up some vague sort of association over the years. Callus wrote little notes. I mean, Callus could be flowers. very nasty with people outside the singing world. Well, they tell me so, but I mean, our as far as we were concerned, Callus was a very nice woman. Well, yes, within the singing world, mm -hmm. she was okay. Uh, I mean, a real friend and, mm -hmm. and a hard worker, mm -hmm. always on time oh, for a, rehearsal. A real worker, yes. That, that's unusual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, People have, have said you were sort of a Svengali. Oh, rubbish. <laughs> yes, but I mean, it, it persisted quite a long time, didn't it? Well, I mean, I, I, I had strong ideas musically, always. But how did and you get this feeling for I, bel canto? I don't know. I have no idea in the world. I did mean, you I'd, play records I'd, when you were a boy? Not a little, yes, but not a lot. Uh, I did. I found a score of um, my, my first thing in the, in the opera was to play the Marriage of Figaro of Mozart in rehearsals. Goosen sent me there from diploma class when the rehearsal pianos were still, and that sort of I, I loved that. Then I played Falstaff, which is much much harder. In fact, I remember old Florent Hochstuhl, who was the head of the opera school, is conducting Falstaff, and he said, "F sharp, you stupid pig." So I thought, <laughs> and I thought to myself as I worked with singers who complained that I was a bit tough on them, and I thought, well, you know, I'm not really tough at all. <laughs> it, it, it was a good experience, but, but, and then I found a score of Puritani. I loved it because it's like Chopin, and, and I used to play, play it through. And I, I, do not, I can't really tell you how. I can only tell you it's an instinct, and I followed my life on instinct. I believe in instincts, and I believe in my own instincts. Uh. And you wrote lots of cadenzas and uh, elaborations. Oh well, that's I mean that as far as I'm concerned, it's easy. You, if you if you study a composer enough, you you work out how he how he writes and what he does. Yeah. The terrible thing about a lot of people writing cadenzas is that they sound as if somebody else wrote them. Yes. And I mean I think if, if with variants and cadenzas, they should not be noticed particularly. They should sound natural as if they were part of the opera, even if you do a, a variation in a second yeah. verse of a cabaletta. It should it, it shouldn't get jump out and hit you in the face. But certain people were horrified, didn't Adrian Bolt make a, a famous joke? Yes, but this is, this is before it became the fashion again. I mean, it was how it was done in the 19th century, but in the 50s and 60s, it was very unheard of. Yes. May I tell them the joke? Of course you may, yes. Um, Joan came for, to sing Messiah for a recording, and when he saw the cadenzas, Bolt said, mad scenes from Messiah. <laughs> And if you listen, if you actually listen to Messiah, very little. And he threw her out. Very little. Didn't very, he? No, no, no. No. No, no. Certainly no. not. But <laughs> now she recorded it with him. Right. He was a he was a nice one, but he always liked his cup of tea in, in the recordings. Yes. <laughs> but gradually, your your ideas in that in that sphere have become accepted. Oh yes, it became accepted after a while. I mean, I wasn't the only one, obviously, but. It, I, I get very annoyed today when, when, when people come along with their cadenzas. I mean, the, what the, the cadenzas they're singing are more important than the aria or the music they're, they're making. And so I, I try to say, look, this is what you're going to do and just do this. Yeah. <laughs> and then when, uh, Zeffirelli was, a, was a, an enormous help too, wasn't he? Oh, he was. I mean, he's a, well, he's a great producer. He's a great, in the early days, a great director. He used to paint the sea, scenery. I'm talking of before Lucia because we heard had seen him a lot. He used to paint the scenery. He'd go out and, and he, even for Lucia, he went around all the junk shops in, in London and bought old materials to make the clothes with so that they wouldn't look just like new costumes on the stage. Yeah. And that was, it was a brilliant production. I'm sure some of you, have, you saw it. And with the, with the curtain went up in, in the mist and this castle going up to God knows where. It was wonderful, unforgettable. And it lasted a long time. I think we still did it there in 80, 86, was it? Something yeah. like that. Yeah. And he uh, almost made a glamour girl out of Joan, didn't he? Well, she could look pretty glamorous on the stage, and of yes. course we were very lucky that we met uh, Barbara Matera, who was the number one costume maker in New York, and she made for a lot of films. She made for Betty Davis and all the big <laughs> Hollywood stars, and she and became and Joan became very fond of each other, and she made all Joan's costumes after a while, and they were incredibly glamorous, wonderful, wonderful glamorous costumes. And I, I believe very much that, you know, if you're on the stage. As, a, as an opera singer, you've got to capture the public before you open your mouth. It's very important. How, how you look is terribly important. Yeah. 
He made her sit down a lot, didn't he? So as to minimise the, the tallness. That I honestly don't remember. I know for a while she used to bend her knees so that she wouldn't uh, be too tall for the tennis. But we, we stopped that because, I mean, it's, it wasn't good for her posture and it wasn't good for the tennis either. But, and, you know, she was not a tall woman. Yeah. Everyone talked about the six-foot soprano. She was five, eight, five foot eight and three quarters. She, would, <laughs> she refused to be even five foot nine. Of course, she wore the hair piled up and, and high heels and so she looked tall. And were there all the people at Covent Garden, were they thrilled that she had such a big, big success? I th they were very, very nice, yes. People were very, very good to her, and, and, and I never felt any jealousy there among the singers at all. Really? They, were, they were really good colleagues. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, I've been in the business for a long time, mm -hmm. and there are two people, only two people I can remember, who nobody has ever said anything nasty about. One was Vaughan Williams, the composer, mm -hmm. Uh, and the other is Joan. Well, no, well, Joan, she was generally just nice to people. All, always in the, in the theatres, all the backstage people adored her, the hairdressers and the wig makers and the, the makeup people. Yeah. She was very, very popular. And I mean, she was just a natural person. She never changed over the years. It never went to her head at all. In fact, I don't think even now she realises what she was. Really? She really, she, she never, she never really realised. But that that night in 59 made her a world star, didn't it? Oh, very much so. And did the, all the agents come running? Uh, yes, and we got rid of most of them. <laughs> and, uh, but the, all the, 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 the theatres wanted her, and, and she was able to, for a while, more, not always, but very often say what she would like to, to sing, which was how we were able to introduce yeah. so many wonderful roles into her repertoire. A because lot of she singers, was, when they suddenly make it, that they have, they have a backlog of messiahs that they have to try and get rid of. Uh, I mean, Janet Baker, for example, yeah, 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 yeah. that happened to her. Mm -hmm. Now, well, Joan, you see, she didn't even have the repertoire by that time. When she sang Lucia, she didn't know Traviata, she didn't know Puritani, Sonambula, so she had to learn them all fairly quickly, which was, which was difficult for her at, the, at that time. Yeah. But, uh, but all of the, the theatres were, were crazy to have her, and... Uh, so we were able to do some wonderfully interesting pieces. And then she started to go around Europe and the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you go with her? Oh, yes. Always? Mm -hmm. And then you started conducting. In, what, what in 62. What idea? And no, I could do it better. I didn't, I didn't have, well, I hope so. I, <laughs> I didn't have any idea about conducting. It wasn't, it wasn't something that I'd really thought about that much. I, when I went to the college, I asked to do conducting second subject. They said, no, you can't. You can do piano accompanying, which I thought was a great insult because I've been doing it all my life. And uh, so I, I never thought about conducting anymore. My grandmother said she was a little bit faced, said she saw me conducting. She said that back in the 40s, but that, that I, and I never sort of took seriously. And uh, it, it all happened. I, I, I was not prepared. Joan was doing a concert in, in Rome, and uh, the conductor w w was ill with flu, I think, and then they got another conductor, and he f was knocked over by a taxi. And uh, her agent said, well, you better get on and conduct it yourself, because no, there isn't anybody. I said, well, you know, that's a laugh, because you know, I don't know anything about conducting. She said, you know the repertoire, get on and do it. <laughs> so I, I got on and did it. And, but I was so lucky. I've always been lucky, and I think luck is, is the most important thing in life. The orchestra in Rome were wonderful to me. They knew I was not a conductor. They knew I didn't know what I was doing. They helped me, mm -hmm. and the concert went well. Yeah. And, and uh, her agent said, well, you know, you, we want you to go on and do this. And, and, and she pushed me then into lots of things. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I, I, my, I made my American debut in the Hollywood Bowl with Byron Janice playing the Rachmaninoff second. Really? Now, you know, for an in, inexperienced, to say the least, conductor, that's a headache. And my friend Henry Lewis, the husband of Marilyn yeah. Horne, we, we were all together in, in, in Los Angeles at that time. He said, look, when you don't know what you're doing, do nothing. And that was a wonderful piece of advice, let me tell you, <laughs> wonderful. I got up as bold as brass and stood in front of the Los Angeles Philharmonic and did very little, I can tell you. <laughs> and they, they played fantastically because they knew, <laughs> they, they knew the concerto. He, Byron Jellis certainly knew the concerto and we did some other pieces. It was fine. And at the end of that concert, I'll never forget it if I live to be a hundred, 
there was a knock on my door. I opened the door and the very glamorous lady was there. I knew exactly who it was. It was Jeanette MacDonald. Mm-hmm. And, and she said, do you know, that was just, this was such a nice concert, I thought I'd come back and tell you so. I was, I've never gotten over that. <laughs> <laughs> she, she had a fan for life. <laughs> but uh, when you conducted first in London, the players gave you rather a hard time, didn't they? I don't remember that they ever gave me a hard time. Do you know who were really wonderful to me were the London Symphony, and I recorded many, many things with them. And uh, the first thing I did in Covent Garden was what uh, Puritani, wasn't it, in 64? I don't remember that the orchestra were nasty or, or no. difficult. In fact, I've, I've spent my life with orchestras having been rather nice yeah. to me. <laughs> Your score of uh, operas, complete operas you've recorded, it uh, ought to be in the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of them, yes. Is it? I mean, I, I, I went through the catalogues and I counted about 45. Well, there are over 50, I can There are over 50. And there are four uh, Bellinis, Mm-hmm. Four Donizetti's operas, mm-hmm. at least. Four Lehars. Mm-hmm. It's it's a terrific achievement. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was I was lucky to be at the right place at the right time. Again, you see, luck. It's it's important. I mean, I know a lot of other conductors who are probably as good and a lot better than I am, but they didn't have the same luck. When did you get married? 1954. Mm-hmm. It's a long time ago, isn't it? Yeah, five years before Lucia. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, I used to live in opposite you in Cornwall Gardens. Yeah, yeah. And I sometimes used to coo at Adam, your son, <laughs> in his pram. And what is he doing now? Adam teaches hotel management. He, he went through all the hotels. He worked for Hilton and God knows who. And uh, after a while, he said, you know, I'm sick of all these terrible hours. I, I get home at two and three in the morning often and I don't have any family life. He said, I'd like to... I think I'd like to teach. So we sent him off to university and he got his deg- teaching degree and now he teaches in the big hotel school in, in Sydney and he loves it. Does, his pupils does he like love music? him. Oh, yes, he's, he's all right. He's, he, he could come to the opera and he's, he's quite cluey about it. He's, yeah. He knows when it's good and when it's not good. Is Joan domestic? Can she boil an egg? Oh, she, well, she never cooks because there's always been someone to cook, but she's, she's quite <coughs> domestic and if she has to cook, she can cook. You know, yeah. simple things, yes. But uh, she, I mean, she, Joan likes doing housework and all things like that. Or she, she used to love to do things like yeah. that. I'm told Callas used to love housework mm-hmm. and and Dietrich, Molly and Dietrich. Oh yes, yeah. Well, she, she was a great she floor model. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time we had a second record. All right. Which is not at all uh, Sutherland or what's the second one? I can't remember. What? What is the second one? Sumi Joe. Oh yes. Sumi Jo is a wonderful singer. I did many, many things with her. and We did Lucia together in the Opera House and many recordings. Uh, she was one of the strongest and most technically proficient singers I ever worked with. And this thing we're playing now is from a live concert we did in Carnegie Hall. And it's just put out like that. It's as was. She sang in that concert everything you can think of. Poor Italian mad scene, all the great big Goloratura arias. And she, and she did this... Uh, piece from uh, Condit of uh, uh, Leonard Bernstein. I think it's absolutely wonderful and it's, and it's untouched by engineers. It's just as, as was. So if the sound is so, so sometimes you know, a little bit, it's, it's a live performance. What I think is so wonderful, it, towards the end of the aria, Bernstein does all the tricks that Rossini would do, changing the rhythm, changing the tempo, uh, uh, to make more and more excitement. Bernstein was a very clever man. <laughs> so, and, Sumi Joe. Yeah. Gay, what is it? Gay and Glitter, be Glitter and be gay.
can they compensate for my fallen state? Purges as they were at such an awful cost. Bracelets, lovely ears, can they dry my tears? Can they blind my eyes to shame? Can the brightest approach shield me from the approach? Can the purest diamond purify my name? And yet my most extremes are in theory. Oh, oh, I was so love I saw for the star. Oh, oh, I would like a twenty carat earring. Oh, oh, if all love you lifts my jewels on. Enough, enough. I take a diamond necklace and show my noble stuff. a fabulous musician. The first time I met her, Decker asked me to make a recording with her, and I said, well, yes, but what does she want to sing? And I said, oh, well, she'd like to do just a disc of arias. I said, well, if she'd like to do some interesting arias, I'd love to make the recording. And they, they said, well, talk to her about it. So I rang her up, and, and, and she said, what, would, what are you thinking about? And I told her a whole stack of, of French arias that nobody would ever heard of. She said, well, she said, can I come and look at them? So she came up to my house and she sat down at the piano. She just played them all like that. She was a brilliant musician. And uh, then we recorded them all and uh, they, they, were, one, they were wonderful. She, she was really... Tell me about person. Australia. You spent a lot of time in Europe and then you spent quite a bit of time in a decade in Australia. Well, in, we went back in, in 1965 because this lovely lady here had a, a father who was, um, well, he was already, by that time, he was J.C. Williamson's, was he not? He was one of four brothers, the Tate brothers. Sir Frank. And, and Sir Frank Tate. And he, he was part of the Melba Williamson season in the 20s. When was it? Uh, 24 or whatever it was, or seven. And um, he said to us, you know, he'd started his career as a young man with Melba, and he'd like to finish it with, with Sutherland, and he, and he created, or uh, helped us to create this Sutherland-Williamson season. And we played in, in Sydney. This is something that would never happen again. In, it's impossible, financially impossible. We did seven operas, seven completely new productions. We played eight times a week for 14 weeks. And it, and it, was, it was wonderful. The, the, we had a... We put together a, a really terrific company. Uh, Luciano Pavarotti came with us when he was, he was an, un, an unknown at that time. And we had a lot of, some, some of the big American singers, Spiro Marlis and, and, uh, and, and oh, it, it was incredible. John Alexander from the Met, it was, it was a wonderful company. And uh, that, that was really something quite unforgettable. 
I had a few rows with Sir Frank, bless his heart, because he would, he would like us to have done Madame Butterfly and Tosca and Bohème, you know, because he knew that they'd fill the houses. He, he was very, he was sympathetic to what we what really wanted, which was to do what we called our repertoire. And he let us do, we did Semiramide, uh, Lucia Traviata, Sonnambula, Lelisi d'Amore, Faust and, and Eugene Onegin, which is a sort of a ni nice, nice <coughs> sort of seven operas. Uh, it was a great time in our lives and we've never forgotten. And I think maybe the, the most exciting night of our entire career, or certainly was one of the two or three, was the last night of Sonnambula in Melbourne. And uh, the audience, they wouldn't go away. The three quarters of an hour after the curtain came down, they were still screaming and applauding and stamping. And they wheeled it out an old piano onto the stage. And it was, this was not something that which had been prepared. It just happened. There happened to be an old ballet rehearsal piano in the wings. And uh, she sang Home Sweet Home for them. It was <laughs> something. Shades of Melbourne. Yes, of course. Of course, of course. Um, Isla. Uh, loves any composer whose name begins W A, mm -hmm. Wagner, Wallace. Maybe she'll get rid to Val Teufel eventually. Mm -hmm. But tell us about Wallace. You you like his music too, don't you? I think he's a, one of the composers that has been forgotten, and and he shouldn't have been forgotten. I mean, a lot of people <coughs> have, have heard Maritana, which which never really completely went out of, out of out of the repertoire. But all the rest of his operas, they're com absolutely completely forgotten. And I've, I recorded this, this last year, Lurleen by Wallace, and it's a beautiful romantic opera. It's a, it's a wonderful piece, because to get, get companies to do these things is very hard work, because nobody wants to spend the money, because they think they won't get the return. And uh, I, it's, it's a great piece. I'd like to do some more. I think he's a, he's a wonderful composer, really wonderful. Wallace was a, a sort of poly musician, wasn't he? He was almost like a Paganini. Well, he was, yes, he was called the Australian Paganini because he spent some time in Australia and, and, and played his own concertos, and, and which unfortunately have been lost. And uh, he, he was a, a, obviously a wonderful violinist, a wonderful composer, and, uh, and a very interesting man, actually. His life would make a good film, I think. Mm -hmm. It would be very interesting. He, I mean, he's, he's the same period as uh, what a little later than Donizetti, or he, or he spanned the last days of Donizetti and went on. And Lurleen was written in 1840, 1845, I think. But never really taken on in Europe, has it? Well, he, in, in his day, yes, because Lurleen was done at Covent Garden in this 1860, and it went. I think they played it for 20 performances without stopping, and it was a, it was a big deal. And, and the critics at the time loved it, and, and Berlioz loved, loved Wallace. He, he wrote wonderful things about him. But, you know, it's like, like many other composers, he's been forgotten. Tell us about your time when you were director of Australian Opera. Well, that, that was a great time because we had a, a whole, we had a company, a real company. We had 36 singers on contract for the entire year which meant that one was able to cast and double cast, even treble cast all the roles. And, and uh, I, I f believed very much in putting into the repertoire operas which we had the singers for. In other words, not saying, well, we're going to do Aida or Turandot and then having to, to bring in God knows who from abroad because we didn't have those sort of singers. And, and we, we did a lot of very interesting repertoire, a lot of I mean, there was a lot of Mozart, a lot of Britain, a lot of Janáček, and, and, but we also did uh, Bellini and, and Donizetti and Meyerbeer, and uh, it, it, it was a great time as far as I'm concerned, and I really, I really loved it. Perhaps we better have a, another record now. What's the next? And uh, the next one is, is nearer home. This is Joan Sutherland singing... <laughs> Un soir, Paris, oh, yeah. la capitaine. This is from, again, a very little known operetta by, by Charles Lecoq. And uh, Joan loved operetta, and uh, we, we often did it. We recorded a lot of it, and, and uh, she didn't get to do as, as much on the stage as she would like to have done, because she really enjoyed herself singing this music. And this is just a, a little Spanish number. Lecoq took over when Offenbach started to decline yeah. somewhat. Yes, very much so, yeah. yeah. And he, he was... A, he was a, very big in, in Paris in the 1870s, 80s, 90s. Un soir, le capitaine, par un 
would you say characterizes Sutherland's voice? Because it seems to me that not only the notes are important in, in, in the character of a singer, but the way they get from one note to the other. Well, I mean, the technique is extraordinary. And, and so many singers today do not concentrate on technique. And Rossini said it took seven years to form a voice, and he wasn't joking. But today, so many of the young singers, they do a year or two, and the opera houses throw them into big roles. And it's a disaster, because they don't last. I mean, Joan she was blessed with a wonderful voice from, by nature from God. And, and, uh, but she, she used it, and she learnt how it worked. And, and, uh, and it, all, it all came from inside. I mean, you, you, when, when she sang, I mean, I'm not talking about a little frivolous piece like that, but when, when she sang the big roles, you, you really felt something. Yeah. And, and, and yet, in the 19th century, a lot of singers were singing big roles at the age of 19 and 20, like uh, the, the famous well, Garcia that, girl. That's, that's true, but I think they were the exceptions rather than the rules. And, well, and, my, and mind you, they were brought up by a father, and they, they had it since they were two years of age. You know? Yes. He was a good singing teacher up to his hundredth year. Yeah, and, and the father, of course, was the first Figaro. Yes. And, and, and yes. So and uh, and and Patty also was brought up in. in, in they Richard, say she was born in a trunk. I think in the, the we've only station. got time for one more record. I think. Okay. 
Well, you better tell them what this one is. This is a, a Maya bear, right? Maya bear. It's, it's, an, it's an aria f- uh, from L'Etoile du Nord, and it's an aria for soprano with obligato of two flutes. And it's, and it's very interesting. For a, a light soprano, it's a tour de force. For a heavy soprano, it's something oh. else, let me tell you. It's, it, it's very interesting to hear what she does in this.
Richard, I think we shall have to stop soon because there's the kitchen um, oh, dinner I see. I see. Uh, for some of us. Okay. Uh, so we'll have one more. Which one would you choose? Which one, what is Esclamante, Ad, uh, Arditi, or Sempre Libera? Oh, let's play the Arditi, it's fun. One of our party pieces. So. <laughs> <laughs> Will you tell Dame Joan tomorrow when you see her that we still love and love her work and we remember her with tremendous affection. Yeah. And it's will. very kind Thank of you. you to have stayed to talk to us. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.